Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. It is time for a cast. It is a sentence cast, but not just any sentence game is on the docket today. It is a three versus three, which is going to depart a little bit from the normal formula and should provide much in the way of entertainment. Let me go ahead and introduce the teams and then we will dive directly into a breakdown of the action. D.O.T. is in the beach lot on the north side as Aeon looks like Sarah from the faction of choice for Rip the Rabbit on the front lines. And then to the right, we have Thistlebanger, otherwise known as Farmslet. He is UEF in the rock slot, which is slightly repetitively redundant, but I hope you can forgive me and we can just move on. Below Deer is Cybran on the beach slot for the south side. It looks like he's going for a very lonely land factory and a whole lot of power generators around his mass extractors. We'll come back to that. We've got Jazzy on the front line as UEF and then Cybran, the faction of choice for Junus 2 on the rock slot. So these guys are gonna run to the front as is the Setton's way. Try to grab that mass in the center. Of course, since the rebalance that happened a fair bit ago now, but some people still haven't adjusted their builds for reclaim takes approximately twice as long. So the meta has shifted slightly on this. You've got a little time to maybe drop a point defense, maybe build a few more units. You're not gonna get as much mass out of it. So your, re your uh, overflow isn't gonna be as high to the rest of your team. And therefore things have to be adjusted in your build order as you anticipate the first few minutes of the game. Since there is no one in the air slot, you're not going to see any tremendously quick rush to the T3 phase. So we're probably not going to see any early strap bombers and whatnot, but you never know. Somebody may throw a surprise at us. As we all know, though, you need to get into the air game early as the beach player because you got to get a transport over here or at least some interceptors to try and deny the island. The rock player has a pretty significant advantage in mass, which kind of tends to favor him later on in the game. A lot of reclaim here and then an extra mass extractor in his typical setup plus the five on the island which he has easier access to so if you want to survive into the late game you really need to contest that island which it does look like dot or dot i guess we should just call him dot from here on out uh dot is going to contest that quite well Blow Deer, on the other hand, is going for a bit more of a long-term approach. He is moving an engineer towards the back. Looks like he's going to try to secure most of the mass extractors in the air player's base, so kudos to him for double eco. That means that he's moving to an air factory much later on into the game and planning out his mass extractor upgrades already. Of course, the adjacency that these PGENs are going to give you lets you do that just a little bit earlier when you might not have the power supply. Otherwise, farms not expanding too far outside of his base. Looks like the beach player is going to pick up the front three mass extractors for the air slot. We'll just have to see who is able to take control of all of this for the north side. Couple of combat units moving up to the front for Jazzy. Rip the rabbit looking very lonely on the front line as these guys cycle through the T3 Rex on the front end. Interesting thing to note, your reclaim values are actually the same, whether you're reclaiming a T1 Rex or a T3 or a Salem or whatever it is. So rather than prioritizing the biggest Rex with the highest mass value, you should actually prioritize what you can get to first or what you think you can easily control in order to force the other guy to reclaim less. So it's not actually advantageous to run for the Salem's. You put yourself in a little bit of a bad situation as far as reclaiming the rest of the mass field goes. We do have an aggressive little NG moving to the front for Jazzy to pick up a bit of extra reclaim to send to his team once all of these wrecks are done for. We'll examine the reclaim values for both sides and see who got more But that time is not right now. Farms going for a very aggressive air build. We got a double opening air factory, one of which is still building engineers to try and get all the build power out that he needs to secure the rest of this. And we do have a land factory going down on the farm mechs. Air engagements over here. That is going to end in an air win for Dot. And he is gonna be able to lock down whatever the hell he wants on the other side of the map. Still got quite a few wrecks over here to reclaim, so we won't look into the numbers quite yet. And it does look, yes, like Bloatier is taking full advantage of the second economy, and he is going to be the mass-powered powerhouse of the south side. Farms is dropping engineers into the air player's base. He is going to be securing 75% uh, of the territory that belongs to the typical air player. Um, Rip the Rabbit 
Moving to the south, looking for some wrecks that apparently do not exist any longer. He's gonna try to suck up that one, but miss and get a tree clump instead. And he needs to be moving over here because Jazzy is really taking the upper hand on that early mass grab. That's not gonna end well for the, for the uh, Northside team later on. So about this island that we've been looking to grab for quite a while now, looks like some interceptors made it over here to lock Dot's factory behind enemy lines. So he's actually gonna have to retreat all of his interceptors over there to guard his home base. Jazzy getting forced into the water by the huge number of T1 troops coming down from the center player. Looks like he used all of that mass to invest in a couple of T2 mass extractors and a whole bunch of units. And he is gonna go the route of the T1 spam embracing the dark side of the early game to try and wipe his enemy player. We do have a T1 radar down, but there's not much in the way of defenses online. All these guys need to do is get a good solid scout across, and they will know that there is nothing standing in the way of a run by actually not even a run by a run through now that we've got rip the rabbit down we're gonna look and he's got 6200 reclaim jazzy has got 6500 which is actually very odd he should have had a lot more mass with his positioning but i guess getting forced into the water and leaving some of these other wrecks behind his uh tampered with the numbers to a certain degree Rabbit moving up to the front line. I do believe that there was an air scout pinged across, if I am not totally mistaken. Yes, some of the things are freshly scouted, so he knows that he can move in with a much more aggressive posture. More factories going down for Jazzy as he struggles to recuperate. Uh, losing your first little bunch of units and getting your ACU forced into the water puts you in a really bad spot on the front line. Yes, there is a choke point, but once you lose your ACU, you can't really block it off unless you got some T2 on the front line to drop some point events. And even then, T1 units can easily overrun that if they come in a great enough quantity. We're working on a dozen land factories for Jazzy, who has invested in quite a bit more mass than his opponent. We've got several extra T2 mass extractor upgrades, three on the north, five to six, on the south, Junus 2 moving up with a T2 ACU, probably going to start building Cerberus turrets in the back to try and slow down this advance. Jazzy moving out of the water in order to cut off the flow of units from the north. This is something that you can do that is very important indeed. You only have to fight a few units at a time, even if you've got hampered health. You can make this happen as long as you don't take artillery shots to the face by walking in a straight line. T1 Bombers moving in from Junus 2 as well as he tries to reinforce the faltering front line. First server tour going down, second on the way. We'll be able to deny those T1 units and force those back, lose a little bit of build power on the front. Couple of mass extractors, but no big deal. Yo, yo, Rip the Rabbit sending in more units still though. And Jazzy is gonna have to retreat back to the water once again with about 1500 health under his belt. Working on no more mass extractor upgrades. I was about to say he was upgrading another, but he is not. In fact, he has just got many land factories down and running them all at a peak efficiency. He will, of course, be able to snatch up more reclaim since he is in control of the front line. And there's a ping down on a T2 air factory that is moving to T3. Looks like DOT is going to be moving into the position of air player very early on in the game. Nine minutes and 42 seconds making a T3 shift while you're trying to control all of this other stuff. That's quite an impressive number indeed. And I do wonder if that's gonna hinder him in securing Navy. He did lose the island. A walk across right there was all it took for those engineers to edge build a land factory. And now he's gonna be in a little bit of a dire strait because we do have cruiser out first from a T2 naval factory and of course destroyers will soon follow for Jonas 2. So uh, this is actually a really good response. They've scouted that. They know there's probably going to be an early strap bomber and you can get a cruiser out, put it right here in the bay, try to get scouts out, tag the strat as early as you possibly can and you should be able to park the cruiser in an area where it will interfere with that strat. Just a couple of volleys from the cruiser will drop the strap bomber, maybe a couple interceptor shots, finish it up 
and that is all you really need to do. We got T2 on Rip's ACU, getting the point defense down to try and creep into this base and secure all of this eco. T1 bombers coming in and using their glorious area of effect to blanket all of these units in bombs. Doing some excellent work, even if you don't kill the units in one pass, you're doing so much damage to the larger group that it softens up those targets, lets the point defense shred through them more quickly, and of course, your own units in equal numbers will come out victorious over those that are napalmed. Jonas is trying to build another Cerberus turret, but of course, those units are going to be in the way, so he's gonna be denied that chance. We got a Cerberus turret versus an Utushula. I have never in my life read the name of a T2 point defense with a Seraphim faction, and I never will again. Mark my words, that Cybern Tour is going to come out the victor despite its puny damage because of that mobile shield. A lovely job with the assist right there. That is probably going to be a gun upgrade in the works. T1 bombers still continuing to flow from the factories of Junus 2. We've got a single T1 sub amidst a vast horde of frigates. That's right, you dirty bastards, run away. You cannot challenge me. I am hiding beneath the waves and I shall hunt you down mercilessly, taking upwards of 30 minutes to chew through this enormous health pool. But by golly, I will do it. Well, it's not often that you see an entire vast fleet flee from one single T1 sub, but we are seeing it today. Farms does not have the counter. And uh, speaking of counters, this is not exactly a great one, but it should do the job. That is, no, that might actually be a cruiser. It is a cruiser. There's a cruiser out first for farms. So that will not, in fact, be able to counter the T1 sub. Moving back over to the front line, the gun T2 Com is mowing through this point event, hammering those units on the front line. Junus 2 having to retreat in the face of such firepower. Zooey's moving up from the rear, and our first Ilshiva from the northern factory is coming in to clean up. This is going to be a total loss of the front base, I fear. Junus 2 does have a couple of T2 point events to fall back on. We got T2 P Gen finishing up for Jazzy, who is going to immediately start building triads. His ACU is now a T2 gun comm with 6,000 HP to its name. He'll move out of the water and begin to mow down these units coming in through the neck. Hopefully he'll be able to save himself. He is going to receive protection from this fleet, which is a good thing. He has protection on both sides of the neck, which is a bit unusual as the mid player. Usually you're fighting off the Navy on at least one side, but he does have a good support structure from his team. And we have an ASF out from the Norse. So first T3 air unit is out there and it looks like Bloat Ear has actually got a T3 air factory on as well. That looked like some kind of combat unit. I'm not entirely sure may have been a bomber, but if it was, I missed it. I do apologize for that. T3 Air Scout getting picked off there. And it looks like we're about even in the air game. Farms, though, has moved to T3 Air, and he is building a strap bomber to try and put a bit of more of an aggressive posture forward. That was a little bit of a jumble of words, but I hope you can stay with me on my meaning. It's been a while since I put out a cast, and when you try to turn out this many words, sometimes they do not all flow correctly as you would wish them to. Another strat bomber in the works. First strat is on the south side. That's probably going to come in across here and wing its way across the back end of the map, picking off T2 mass extractors as it goes. Between farms and DOT, they should be able to secure air control. Actually, farms by his lonesome appears to have more air than the entire south side, and the cruisers have moved to the north, so they will not be able to be in place to deny that strat bomber. Well, the Strat Bomber keeps delaying, and with each moment it delays, it probably does less damage. There goes Rip the Rabbit, hammered down by three Salems. That is a bad way to go. Jazzy is going to be able to secure the middle, and now Farms is in control of three bases with which to build whatever he wishes. Strat Bomber's moving in UEF1, so they will be able to do a pretty decent amount of damage, although now that I think about it with the recent balance changes, any of the faction Strat Bombers will be able to drop T2 Mexes in a single blow. T2 Mex and a whole lot of build power going down. 
Second Strat is still alive, although the first has died. ASF just barely going to be able to pick that one off. I wish the other bomb had been right here because if both had dropped on the same locale, could have knocked out that T3P gen and Blodeer would have had a bit more trouble recovering his air game. But he is going to keep that T3P gen alive. We've now got six factories total, one T2 that is heavily assisted versus farms single factory that I now realize is T3 and is pumping out a battle cruiser. So he's, he has succeeded in the UEF way to play. You basically just stall to the T3 phase, pump out a battle cruiser, and then you win the game, which means that Blodeer is probably going to have to either rely on excellent micro and stealth, which is not likely considering that there's so many frigates on this side that farms can just push on ahead into his fleet as a meat shield and get the free intel that way. Uh, but he may have to move to T3 in order to build battleships versus the battle cruisers. Although that is a losing proposition unless you have a whole lot of mass to dump into that kind of thing. It looks like Farms is on top of the pile mass wise right now with 265 income blow deer at 202 DOT at 214. But bear in mind that this is two double bases. So these guys are of course going to be higher then the three on the south side in most cases we got 105 for jazzy on the front and then junus 2 at 115 so that's going to be uh 320 ish mass versus four 485 so that is still a very significant economy lead for the north side interestingly enough we've got units moving over towards the middle from farms, but these are not going to be a huge threat because the destroyers have such short range. On the north side, we got a couple of T2 subs out, but those are not going to do particularly well. Versus the destroyers, the Jonas 2 is pushed to the front. T2 subs not worth their weight in the torpedo game, which is one of the few areas where I do think that a balance change from equilibrium is uh, it's somewhat reasonable. I wouldn't say it's a fantastic idea, but somewhat reasonable. It's a little odd that your designated submarine hunters would lose in a mass-to-mass -mass battle versus destroyers of two out of the four factions, but it is the way it goes in the current balance, and therefore I'm wondering why on earth these things are even being built. One of the few uses that they do have would be circling around to get at the cruisers in the rear, since so many cruisers are being built. But if you're versus UEF and you've got a bit of good micro on hand, you can use subs to great effect by maneuvering them where the number of coopers is lowest. We've got a battleship on the way for Bloatier just barely in time because somewhere out here in the wide, wide waters, yes, right there, there should be a Neptune moving in. And that is going to come up to the front line deal a whole bunch of damage, probably take a three or four destroyers quite easily. You can see we've got shield boats moving up to the front line. Actually, uh, nope, that may have been a little bit of a glitch with the graphics because of the way I was moving the camera. I was about to say it might be power stalling, but that is not the case. Those shield boats are quite cheap. Let's actually take a look at exactly how much they cost. The Bulwark is in at 1300 mass for 10 for 8,000 HP on the shield, which of course can regen. So if you build one Neptune and two Bulwarks, I think that is going to be about the same mass value as a battleship. The Battle Cruiser is gonna have about a 25% increase in damage. It's gonna have a little over half the HP, but throw those couple of Bulwarks in with a shield recharge and come out about even. And then the battle cruisers are much quicker than battleships of any of the factions, so they will be able to pursue and close range quite easily. Battle cruisers probably the single strongest naval tool of the UEF faction, even though their battleships are quite nice as well. We've got a little bit of a naval engagement on the north. Four destroyers of the Exodus class versus three Salem's. That is a theoretical win 
for the north side, but I'm not too sure because each of these cruisers is able to throw in a pretty scary amount of damage as well, inaccurate though it may be. So this is honestly anybody's game, although considering the hover spam that is now moving to the center, I would tend to favor DOT. Looks like we got some good clumpaging going on. Thistlebanger grouping up his navy to prepare for an attack. A little bit of an air engagement there, trying to pick off some scouts as they go by. Below Deer is upping his eco quite rapidly, moving around, grabbing these T3 mass extractor upgrades, trying to scale his eco so that he will be able to keep up with Thistlebanger's navy. We've got two battle cruisers out now, and we're almost, well, we do have two battleships, and we're at 30% on a third. But this is a game changer right here. Loads of torpedo bombers gonna do 30% damage to that battleship and knock out a cruiser and a destroyer on their first pass. Circle back around, taking good use of that Shift-G command, whittling away at the HP on that battleship even further. The battle cruisers moving in to bring their beams to bear, eliminating the first battleship of the three on hand. Frigates, of course, moving in to engage because you want that HP out in front of your more valuable units. Farms bringing in his ASF to cover for the torpedo bombers that uh, Junus 2 was trying to drop with those interceptors. Blodeer does not want to pick an air fight right now, but he is going to dive in anyway to try and eliminate some of these torps because he knows for a fact that if he loses Navy here, he is going to be in for a very bad time indeed. Looks like Junus 2 has finished his teleport upgrade. Uh, no, he's finished his Mazer upgrade and is now moving on to teleport, which is the more expensive of the two. I'm not particularly sure where he's going to go with that. Everything is a bit spread out, and one of the ACUs is in the water, so I imagine he is going to go for farms. Maybe he'll be able to make it work. We do have naval superiority secured by farms, so even if he does perish to a telemazer, he will hand over a win to his one remaining teammate. Although I would hope he builds Teledefense before then. Torpedo Bombers moving on the last battleship. We've got another 50% complete, but I don't think it will be out in time before these Neptunes eliminate the T3 HQ. 500 plus DPS on those Neptunes. It is a brutal thing to see it work. They're going to rapidly knock down that factory. That is the end of the Navy on the south side. So Farms is going to be free to move his economy elsewhere and try to assist his teammates on other things. The Exodus class is pretty bad at hitting a single target, but as you can see, when they are massed in numbers, they do quite well for themselves due to the tremendous amount of damage that they are able to do. Looks like Teleport is getting close to done, about 75%. Farms has, as of yet, queued nothing but more air factories. So I think, oh, nope, there it is. He's now building T1 point events. This is going to be a race against time. We've got 80%-ish on the ACU upgrades. We'll have to wait and see if he's able to be successful. Looks like T1 units are just hammering away at the front line. Collapse is imminent. There was a lot of teching going on, a whole lot of T3 mechs is on hand, but if you're not building combat units, then you're gonna have a bad time when your mechs have to fend for themselves. Looks like a Titan is online. There is a Percival coming out of the factory, but yes, moving back to Titans, because of course, those are gonna be much better at knocking down the T1 units. Looks like we're about to have a teleport that is placed right here next to farms. We've got six T1 PD online, farms going down. Juna's taking heavy damage. He needs to target down those point events if he's going to survive. 5,000 HP, 4,000 HP on the dial. There goes the PD and he's walking away from the power generators before he takes their death damage. You gotta get away from those things. There's the veteran C back up over 14,000 HP. That is an amazing shot just in time. T1 Bomber's coming along. He is going to knock out the entirety of the air grid. No more production on the right side of the map, so these ASF are going to be all that there is until the 
production can can uh, come online over on the left. I am jumbling my words once again. We've got another teleport. Oh, that's going into the back base. So he is actually going to try to knock out even more of the economy of the north side team. It is DOT versus the world at this point. But he is doing a fantastic job of it. He's actually got full control of both navies as of just a moment ago with the Exodus class moving in on the production of Junus 2. That is actually a really good move for him because he's going to be able to secure the entirety of the map and then one by one pick off the enemy ACUs. We got T1 anti-air going down both for bombers and for mercies and a good thing that he has done so indeed because here come the aforementioned mercies. One is going to get through but that is it and he can easily shrug off that damage with his massive HP pool thanks to that veteran C. We got a Sam coming online and a T3 engineer is building P-Gens. I think Ravagers would be much more uh, much more handy in the current situation, and there it is. So he's going to try to build some T3 point vents. Torpedo Bombers moving in to try to protect the production. These units were out of place on the north side, which is what let these slip by and kill the naval production. Looks like that is going to be the end of any navy for the south side. There are enough units down here to be able to lock this for all eternity. We got a couple of engineers on the north side. Or Junus 2, but as long as these are responded to in a quick manner, they won't be able to get up to any mischief. That's a whole lot of torpedo bombers with nothing to do with them. Junus 2 moving up to the north slightly, ever so slightly. Cerberus turret going to try to pick off that T3 engineer, and it's going to be successful so that no more Ravagers can be built, so the response time is going to be quite long on anything from over there. UEF Tech is actually going to be a problem because the only T3 factory is down here. There's actually no T1 factories anywhere other than over here. So UEF Tech needs to be transported to the other areas of the map post haste so that that tech is not lost and you can build some of the tools that that faction has. We've got a nuke sub out. Actually, two nuke subs. I do believe that Farms built those before he died because there's nothing going on at that T3 factory as of yet. No, one of them was built after Farms' death, so this might be moving into the nuclear apocalypse stage. We got a Monkey Lord on the front line that's already got one kill. That's probably going to be a denial tool for anything that comes ashore. Exhibit A, this thing right here on the beach, because of course, if you're this player, you want to get all of the reclaim that you can get your grubby little mitts on. And if possible, maybe build a T4, maybe build some point events, get some things online that can harass the mainland. At this point, we've got a massive economy for DOT, 555 mass per tick. What more could you ask for in life? But Blodir has finished his entire move to T3 mechs and is rocking 437 himself, throwing another 115 and 154 for Genus 2 and Jazzy. And what that translates into is a desperate need for DOT to snipe off an ACU or two. Blodir has also finished a nuclear silo right down here, which he is assisting with all of his might, probably hoping to sink a nuke or two into the north side. Maybe he'll be able to hit something critical. Strat Bomber's pooling up to try and have a go at a Junus 2, who is building a couple of hives to get a little more build power on the back end of things. Of course, your T3 ACU does have quite quite a bit of build power, but you are going to need more if you're going to expend quite a bit of mass. Jazzy moving to the rear, already building up a fabricator pattern with SACU spam because he knows with these uh, Summit Class battleships, where do they go? Right here on hand. He is not going to be in control of this economy for long. The Summit's already knocked out most of the mass extractors on the front line, and now they are hammering away at Bloatier's base. Something to keep in mind, the Summit class actually has the same range as the TAC missiles from a cruiser, so those are going to be able to reach way the hell inland and soften up those defenses possibly even better than a cruiser can. Oh my goodness, we have got some shenanigans going on up here. We got a couple attack launchers up. Those are going to be going after 
the T3 Air Factory, if he had been synchronized on the firing cycle and had two in the chamber, he could have knocked out that Air Factory. But now we've got TMD up. Unfortunately, no way to know that for Junus 2, who's going to take two strap bombs to the face. He's going to upgrade the shield gen, which instantly regens the bubble. Little tip that you can use there if you're ever having to fend off an attack. You can actually upgrade the cybern shields and pause them at 99%. And if artilleries come in and strike, or if you get hit by something big, all you got to do is unpause a couple of shields and like half a second later, you get a brand new shield bubble. Wait for those to go down and repeat the process for a minute or however many shields you have in the area. Now, he has scouted this, so there is no excuse any longer. There's two TMD here, which will be able to easily deny any attack missiles that he launches into the area. Good old Aeon, Aeon attack defense. So he should definitely stop hitting this. 137 HP on that T3 PJ. Oh my goodness, a single T1 bomber would take that out. He should definitely be tacking off these T3 mass extractors all around the outside edge. Let's actually take a look and see what that can reach. Quite a good bit of economy indeed. But he does have Medusas moving up from the rear. And those will be able to take out quite a bit of this if they are not responded to. Taking another look at the south side, we've got a whole new wave of Zui and Yenzin spam. The other tanks, of course, not that great individually. You would be better off building Ilshivas for a mainline combat unit, but these have a little bit of flexibility because you can send them across the water, you can send them across the land, and they are quite fast indeed. We've got a Monkey Lord on the case, though, that is going to move up and try to cut off the flow of units on this side. Do bear in mind that since the last balance patch, though, this will not vet effectively on T1, so T1 artillery can actually come in and kill a Monkey Lord. They changed the veterancy from kill-based to mass-based. So the T4 has to kill 50%, I think. It might be 75, I don't recall exactly. But it has to kill a percentage of its mass in units. And 50% uh, of a Monkey Lord in T1 artillery, that's a lot of units. That's a lot of units. Monkey Lord gonna take quite heavy damage. Move back from the flow now. We've got Percivals, which are definitely not going to be the best, moving in to try and defend. And a Megalith is now up on the front line, hammering away at the Navy, but that is also going to be taking heavy damage from the units in the area. We've got TAC missiles coming in now from the nuclear subs, something that a lot of people forget about when they're building nuke subs. These actually have a horrendous amount of damage. I think in the case of the Aeon TAC sub, it's something like a thousand or two thousand damage per missile, and that can add up very quickly, especially if your opponent has not built TMD. Also, they have a much longer TAC missile reach than cruisers, so you'll be able to hammer things farther back into the bases, even potentially the nuke defense that your opponent has built to try and stop the nuke subs. So we are about halfway to a nuke on these subs. Will be a few minutes before those are loaded. The Megalith has gone down to the combined fire of about a dozen Exodus, counting the ones that it killed. Monkey Lord moving in, slowly working its way towards another veterancy as it pummels these T1 artillery, but of course it's not going to be very effective due to the retargeting speed and its general badness at hitting hover units that are on the move. But it will eventually get the job done. Speaking of tack missiles and cruisers, there's a clump right over here that is pursuing the Monkey Lord. Not sure why you would be trying to target a moving a moving object with cruisers that only fire at uh, the uh, stationary targets. But I suppose we can forgive him for auto-target. Of course, if he does forget to keep moving the Monkey Lord, it would pretty quickly die, so that is another thing. I appear to have missed a drop. That was... nope, never mind pretty standard issue son of a gun point defense was claimed I will pretend that did not happen under my watch Junus 2 sitting in the back regenning health calmly as he waits for another opportunity to teleport the monkey lord in the middle has finally accumulated another veterancy 
but its total HP pool has not really climbed by that much because it is still taking consistent damage. We've got Loyalists on the field though now. That is an excellent response to all of the units from the front. Loyalists, of course, pretty speedy, good on damage, got that EMP weapon as well, letting them contend with T1, T2, and T3 to great effect, arguably even better than the brick in some cases, depending on your micro. That Percival is gonna have a bad time versus all these units, I can already tell you, but hopefully it will be able to deny any serious damage to the base, although as I'm looking at it, it does not seem likely. Air on the top side, that probably means that something is headed up this way, or it might simply mean that there is an air battle taking place. This is actually a really good deal. Junus 2 building an Omni on the rear under a stealth gen so that his team has got intel on the entire map. Because of course, unless you can build your Omni about right here, you don't actually cover the entire enemy base. So they can build an Omni on this side and an Omni on this side for full radar coverage. We got two nukes going out. One of them is hitting the T3 power over here and the other is hitting the T3 power over here. Although why on earth you would target two T3 power generators with a nuke? I know not, unless of course you're just worried about killing off all of the power supply, which is actually a good call in this particular case because with all of the mass in hand, all of the reclaim in hand, power is by far the most valuable commodity for DOT. But he does have a fifth T3 power generator on the way to the south, and his air production is not all that large, so he should be able to make it just fine on the eco that he has. And there's what we've been waiting for. Two nuke subs releasing their payloads immediately moving away so that they cannot be tracked by the trajectory of the missiles. You've got to remember to do that, especially when there's so many T2 bombers and blow here. No! That is going to be an elimination and also an elimination of two nuke launchers, a whole bunch of T3 power, air production, and various and sundry other things for the south side team. That is a heavy blow indeed. Where was the anti ass? Oh, there was anti, says DOT, in response to farms calling him out for wasting two missiles. That was a brilliant hit, and actually looking at it, most of them are paused due to the lack of power, but he has built a hell of a lot of tactical subs, so good on him for finding a bit of an odd solution to the problem. So now, he's got two ACUs to kill. He's got 75% map control. He just took out the biggest sector for production on the south side. This is actually looking pretty dang good for DOT. He's got a T3 Rascom hiding out in the water that is actually moving way the hell out into the water. This could be either a good or a bad thing because if you're way out here, you're very unlikely to be found. However, if you are found, there's this little thing called masses of tort bombers that can kill your ACU in a single pass and you're really not going to have anywhere to go to escape. So, could present an issue. Just saying. We got a Monkey Lord and a group of Loyalists that might be ready to move up into the front. And there's not really a whole lot that would deny it. Actually, this other Monkey Lord has made it to the front and it is going to plow a hole right through the front base, eliminating all of those hover tanks, racking up veterans as it goes, although it is already a T5, so I guess it can't really rack up any more veterans -y. But it's at full HP and it's got 188 kills to its name, so we might need to rename this one the Mass Assassin. T3 power generators going down in the middle. Of course, DOT's biggest task at hand is to build more T3 power generators in more locations to try and recover his power grid. Uh, actually, that Monkey Lord, what killed these power generators? Was that another nuke? I don't think it was, but I really want to know now. It might have been the Monkey Lord. I may have missed something very important. Hopefully, you can see on the minimap. Junus 2 hanging out in the back, just chilling out. Jazzy in control of 726 mass income, although it looks like he's burning a lot of that income to make more income and more nuke defenses, which is a good thing. He's got none loaded so far, which is a bad sign when you got a couple of nuke subs off your shore that are surely loading once again. Looks like we've got zero, zero, and all of these are paused, so that might not actually be the case, although a lot of them are half-loaded. 
use their missiles. Yes, good call out from farms. The Monkey Lord continuing to move up into the bases. Too bad there wasn't a T3 air factory online to pump out a few mercies. That would have been a good idea. Monkey Lord moving into the PD. I'm gonna knock out that HQ and definitely secure those T3 power generators so things looking a fair bit more dire for DOT. I really had high hopes, but he just doesn't have the tools to deal with this intruding Monkey Lord. The north side is looking rather sparse at the moment. Thankfully, he does have his resource allocation to at least get a little bit of power on his side. Scout wave incoming, says Farms. Of course, he is seeing all of these air scouts passing over the head of the cruisers below. That means that your ACU needs to be in a safe place because once it gets scouted, you could be sniped in any number of ways. Okay, so the way this is breaking down, <laughs> it is very difficult for the north side to be reached by the south, but once a unit does get up in there, there's not a whole lot to stop it. You just gotta get past this massive naval blockade. Looks like ASF moving in to try and eliminate all of the tort bombers that it can before they get knocked out, so that hopefully that ACU is a little more survivable in the water. Jazzy, you are disgusting. Control K that now. What are you talking about? Oh, okay, so something got scouted. Is he building? Something is being pinged. Oh, we got two Galactic Colossuses. Those are gonna be fantastic for tearing a new one in this side of the map. We got two Megaliths online though, so maybe not the be all end all. We've got uh, nuke subs still not loading, but the missiles are coming in to try and hit up some of these more valuable targets. Oh boy. It is not easy to tell how this is gonna end, but I do think DOT is now at a distinct disadvantage. We got strat bombers coming in on the Galactic Colossus. It's gonna inflict a little bit of pain, and of course, once we get two Megaliths online, yeah. I was excited about those GCs at first, but I do, I do think that they're going to be completely outclassed by the Megas, the Strats, and everything else going on down here. And it's going to be very difficult at this point to recover for DOT. It is such a shame because if he'd been able to load a couple more of those nuke subs, he would have been able to knock out all of this. There's only one nuke defense loaded. He's got all of this open opportunity for damage. GC is going down to the Megaliths, moving in. Abandoning his buddy, sad. Uh, I'm not sure what you're talking about. And we got a ping out for DOT's commander. Looks like DOT is moving in to commit honorable Sudoku. Oh, he's gonna get taken out by his own TAC missiles. <laughs> That's awesome. Brilliant. He ground fired all of the subs and then walked through them. Misclick with the bad luck. I am not actually sure if that was a misclick or not. I think that might have been intentional. Well, there you go, guys. A little bit of a fizzled ending, but hopefully you enjoyed it. A very, very unconventional sentence game. That air snipe, though, recovering it for the Southside team, it was lost up until that point, but with the snipe on farms, they managed to pull it back. Alrighty, guys, that is gonna wrap it up for this cast. As always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you to everyone who supports the channel by either watching, liking, subscribing, or supporting directly through Patreon and whatnot. There are links in the description if you wish to take part in that. And of course, the names on the screen right now belong to the very special people who are supporting quite heavily. I will see you guys in the next one.